to that. <laughs> the Nobel Foundation uh, until the 1950s was the largest uh, taxpayer for town of Stockholm, but of course Venegrin didn't pay a, a cent. Uh, then the, the Venegrin Institute, uh, which uh, still exists here at the university, uh, and uh, 1941, the Venegrin Foundation for Anthropological Research, which uh, uh, has an endowment about $300 million uh, and uh, funds uh, uh, mostly uh, graduate students doing uh, field research in anthropology uh, uh, throughout the world. And then the Venegrin Stifted Center, you all are familiar with the landmark, the Venegrin Center, and this way uh, Venegrin did manage uh, to put his uh, name and and seal on uh, which was then the uh, I think the third highest building of, uh, of Stockholm, and he, he had uh, uh, his offices on the top floor. But he he died just uh, a month before it was uh, uh, in, inaugurated. Uh, but just to give you a size of uh, an understanding of the size of the magnitude of the foundations, the Foundation in New York and the foundations here together uh, have a large endowment uh, than the Nobel Foundation. And uh, in uh, in the United States, uh, at least, if you uh, if you get a no. Venegrin grant, no, or no, 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 uh -huh. no. Okay. no. Uh, and uh, so, if you get a grant from uh, in Foundation in New York, uh, and you put people say I I got a Venegrin, like people say I got a, a Rhodes, I got a Humboldt, I, one of the prestigious uh, things. And uh, uh, the Stockholm Foundations uh, uh, they fund uh, uh, more scientific uh, research currently than uh, the Swedish uh, Scientific Council. So. Uh, well, this is uh, the story about uh, Axel Wiener-Green I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to come up in front, but <laughs> my, my sixth son has fell asleep here. And uh, I'm, I'm, even though it's only one year old, I'm quite surprised because this was extremely intriguing and a fascinating, uh, fascinating speech. Thank you very much for this. Uh, this I think we have some time for comments, for questions. This is an incredibly rich story, I must say, with a number of, uh, of things that I think we might, might need uh, further discussion. Uh, could you also, I think you said so at the beginning, but only in passing, say something about what you're publishing on it and, uh, yeah. and what the plans are on that. And book wise, for those who'd like to read more, that would be the first question. Yeah, I, uh, mm -hmm. I organized, I mean, the, the research is funded by uh, the two foundations and by my own university in the United States, Virginia Tech. Uh, I have uh, lived for two years uh, at the foundation, I don't know if you know, and there are 165 apartments for scientists uh, uh, behind the Venegrin uh, Center. Uh, the condition is you can't be Swedish uh, to live there, but there are mostly people that work at, at Karolinska. I mean, it, it's an enormous uh, contribution to uh, the scientific uh, research. Uh, as part of this uh, project, I organized a symposium uh, last May at the foundation on, uh, on Vanagrain, and I brought uh, together all the surviving relatives, uh, business associates, I I brought the head of uh, the archaeology department from uh, Peru, uh, so there were people there from uh, Peru to Mexico, the Bahamas, uh, United uh, States, uh, Sweden, uh, and uh, published a, a book where I, I wrote a, an introduction of 20, 30 pages uh, about uh, the life of Vena Green, and then it has abstracts. Uh, uh, Vinegreen had one of the most famous art collections uh, in the world, which is now in uh, in Mexico, and 
but all of a sudden uh, Mexico being uh, Mexico uh, uh, more than half of them supposedly are not originals even though uh, they had been uh, several experts before had uh, original so anyway I have uh, we have a little book uh, out on that that one can get uh, at the foundation and then the foundation uh, celebrated its uh, 50 year anniversary uh, uh, l last year and uh, uh, there we had uh, uh, I wrote a piece on uh, Rainer Green uh, as a philanthropist uh, how it uh, how it started also because he didn't have uh, any children he really uh, he gave uh, he gave his money to science he uh, he started uh, to do that when he was uh, in his 20s and uh, uh, did it uh, throughout his life. Uh, he was always very conscious that his name should be associated with it, but uh, that is not that uncommon for uh, for rich people. And all of this is part of a book project uh, that is entitled uh, Reality and Myth, the Life of Axel Wiener Green, that, uh, where I'm, I'm laying out uh, I can make that case uh, quite in detail about uh, the blacklisting. Uh, there are uh, and the, the U.S. government still does not acknowledge that Wayne Green was blacklisted uh, uh, on grounds that were not that one can't justify and because the the reason is if they would have had to acknowledge it they would have had to pay billions of dollars mm -hmm. in uh, in damages uh, and uh, mm -hmm. so this is so I'm, and there are archives everywhere uh, of course the only uh, place where I couldn't get access uh, is because uh, SEPO claims that they don't have a file on Axelvenagrin which I, I don't believe it. Stay up for your concept. Uh, that uh, so uh, it's uh, interesting uh, that Sweden, to some degree, is more secretive, and of course, this is a very sensitive topic uh, in the Swedish royal family uh, because of uh, uh, then Prince Gustav Adolf and uh, his connections. Uh, with uh, Göring and others uh, uh, before he died in 1947 and uh, and all, I mean, la last year was this great controversy about uh, uh, Dolping Sevilla's uh, uh, family and I uh, think here too uh, uh, the best thing to do is to uh, let researchers uh, look at the material because Many times, what is sort of the established truth is really not the truth. I we will come back to Castro's business. My question is: is it was no political motivation behind the the sealing of the Gramma to Castro's movement? He didn't do it. He didn't sell it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Vena Green. Uh, why? It doesn't make. It doesn't make sense for several reasons. First, uh, I uh, I have the the testimony from the person who actually bought it, uh, and he described this couple, Ericsson, from whom he bought it. The ship was uh, something that. Vena Green uh, would have never put his foot on because it was uh, a dilapidated old uh, ship. It would have been a small affair. Uh, this was bought for, uh, the grandma was bought for $20,000. But the interesting th thing is why, why was this put in? And there are also claims that Vena Green was landing one of his islands in the Bahamas for 
the training of the Cuban exiles uh, that trained for the Bay of Pigs. So you, you have it on, uh, both, sides. on, on both sides and uh, uh, of course he had very important friends and he had uh, enemies in very high, uh, high places. And, but to my best knowledge that story is about the grandma is simply not true. Okay. Uh, but he uh, he did have close relations with friends of Fidel Castro. For example, I found a letter from uh, the painter Diego Rivera uh, to President uh, Prado in the Mexican archives, where he writes about uh, thanking the president for the support given uh, to Axel Wenger Green, and he hopes that that uh, can continue and Diego Rivera was one of uh, the few people that publicly denounced when uh, at one point Che Guevara and Fidel Castro were imprisoned in uh, in Mexico just before they left on the, on the Grand Line. So Ven Green was, well, he, uh, he would have uh, dinner with some uh, somebody like Goering and he would have dinner with somebody on the left I guess in the end, it was about connections and making money. But in his book, he clearly laid out his vision that he was against totalitarianism, whether it was on the left or on, uh, on the right. Yes, please. No, uh, you know that he had a research center at Norton's hospital here at Rosa Stam. and because my father was one of them who, who got money for his research with small children. Um, he had so, uh, he, so they had lots of uh, student, doctor students coming there to the Van in <laughs> Research Institute and they were surprised it's so small. <laughs> but they were <laughs> they had much research in that small place. He uh this is this is just a list of uh the the most significant mm. ones. There is a a Venegrain Aeronautical Laboratory at the University of Kentucky in the yeah. United States yeah. where that he endowed where he developed uh, uh an, an engine for uh, fighter planes. Uh, in in Sweden he had a number of uh, charities and, and research laboratories. Uh, he had a uh, he was discussing with Dag Hammarskjöld uh, the, the creation of the uh, United Nations University for Peace mm -hmm. uh, and this was the last time Wenagrin was actually seen in public was at the funeral of uh, Dag Hammarskjöld and he checked uh, into Karolinska and by himself and so the he was a man of, uh, of vision and his idea was that uh, science would bring uh, peace. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, but I know how they met because he wanted a doctor and in July, and there was no doctor <laughs> available, but my father was available because he was a, a researcher. <laughs> and, and what is the name of your father? Uh, John Lind. John Lind. <gasps> so, uh, and then he told him about his research, and uh, Axel said, oh, that's interesting. I would like to. Uh, Help you. Yeah, and and medical research. Oh, no, uh, it was medical. Uh, yeah. That that was always yeah, his, uh, his special mm -hmm. love. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, when Wendy Green went uh, left Sweden the first time when he was uh, 21, then mm -hmm. he went and studied at the University of Greifswald, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there was a a professor named uh, Rosemann. Uh, and who uh, 
he became so enthusiastic after that that that's when he decided that he would dedicate his life uh, raising money for science and he said raising money was so hard that he decided to make it himself <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's how he thought it so uh, yeah, and that, that's all one needed, uh, access uh, to uh, Axavenogren and a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them did not work, uh, no, but, but in, some in of them In July worked. it was some difficulties to get it. Uh, I think you wanted a child, doctor. I'm going to Peru next year. Can <laughs> I yeah, can I find anything about Venegreen uh, in Lima or Machu Picchu? Do they have some memories or? Well, uh, I can give you the name of an excellent guide that uh, uh, in Machu Picchu that. Uh, the professor uh, can give you his name too. Uh, that is still alive. Uh, and his family uh, owned uh, all of Aguas Calientes, the whole area uh, down Machu Picchu. Uh, and he was coming to give a talk uh, to at my symposium, but he's so old that I thought he needed a guy. So I I called that guide I knew who was at Machu Picchu and said he wants to fly to Stockholm <laughs> to bring them. So he knows and uh, about uh, Axel Wiener Green and in the in Cusco uh, there, are, there are various uh, collections uh, and uh, In some of them, uh, they, are, they they received the publications from uh, the New York uh, uh, Foundation. Uh, there's a, a Julio C. Teo archive. Uh, Teo, T-E-L-L-O. And he's considered really one of the most eminent scientists in, uh, in Peru. And there is... Uh, there th there's this unpublished manuscript that Julio Citeo wrote uh, on uh, his expedition uh, to Vinia Vaina with funding from Venegrin and there's there are letters, uh, there's correspondence between New York and Peru. So mm -hmm. that is quite a bit. Sorry, is this area still called the Venegrin National Park? No, yeah, it is not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Then, then, uh, then more people would know about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. no, it's, uh, it's not. It doesn't have a, a name anymore. I have one question and, and one reflection, perhaps. Uh, the first one concerns a bit the character of Wagner. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that you're, you're very right. It is a fascinating and uh, largely forgotten figure, and, uh, and that obviously brings to mind to what extent his personality influenced obviously in his business enterprise, but also in the scientific enterprise, the cultural expedition. And uh, I must confess I'm part of it. <laughs> but how, how directed was he? How much did he actively intellectually participate in, in the expedition in, in Peru? Was he a bystander or did he take active part in it? And the second reflection would be exactly on, on the very interesting point that you raised, which is the availability of documents. There was at a conference in Washington um, only a week ago when they talked about the classification of US documents, which is obviously I think far more advanced than most other countries, considering the Western European ones and, uh, and the statute of limitations seems to be shorter in, in the US. It is uh, it just that what what they also do in the, in the United States is uh, uh, you see a file and the file ends in uh, in 1946 and it ends with uh, a letter uh, from the Attorney General saying that the investigation uh, now has ended and then you believe it but I, I didn't I saw no reason why there would be a file from 1959 and 1960 
so it, it continued mm-hmm. and but and that part is gone or in, but it that's still better than in Mexico where in most of the files about vena green uh, is just some other material whenever it's potentially compromising you know. uh, so to what degree uh, uh, was he the brain behind the expedition uh, he initiated it in terms of uh, the area. He was really fascinated, and he had been in uh, in Peru uh, the year before, had excavated uh, with together with uh, some Peruvian uh, scientists. So he was really interested in in science, in discoveries, but uh, and the fact that. That he he writes about it. Uh, uh, I mean, he published a, a little uh, uh, pamphlet called "My Interest in Science," and uh, so he he saw himself as somebody that was interested in science and wanted to fund it, but he was not engaged in designing uh, the expedition. When he was there, he was uh, he was sleeping like everybody else up there in 3,000 uh, meters, and he was uh, suffering from the uh, uh, same uh, illnesses. Uh, but he was not he was not a he had a I could say a scientific mind, uh, but his specialty was really applied science. That's how he. Uh, he made his money with the vacuum cleaner and the refrigerator and his his latest uh, big project was uh, uh, this monorail uh, and why that never became I mean this has become a reality I mean it, it exists uh, in uh, in several countries but it's not called Alvik which was Axel Leonard Venegreen and but he he poured millions and millions into this and uh, and then uh, Krupp took it over uh, so he had in a way he was a man of uh, science but not, not the way we are but he he read a lot uh, he was interested enough that I know from his diary that he started to learn Spanish uh, while traveling uh, to Peru so and and he surrounded himself with the uh, people uh, like Hugo Theorel, uh, uh, who was leading uh, the Stockholm Foundation. Always the m- most important minds. Uh, his biggest dream was he was creating the foundation, and Niels Bohr had already agreed to uh, to head it. Uh, so it uh, doesn't get better than that. <laughs> If you know the files of the mm. FBI, how much is after 46 of it? Well, uh, the officially nothing. This is <laughs> so what they what they have brought me in the archives, and and sometimes in the archives they tell you uh, they don't have the file, and I have the file number, mm-hmm. and exactly it's a, a date. I filed a freedom of information request and I asked for this document and I got a letter back from uh, the uh, head of the office of the Attorney General saying that this file cannot be located. So, uh, but how do you know that it's so big? How, no, because yeah, what, 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 no, what, well, it's even file. bigger. <laughs> Just what I have seen. Oh. Uh, wh- when they bring it out, you you want to cry. Oh. Uh, so we, you know, uh, he uh, he was followed on a daily basis. But there were FBI agents trailing him uh, for years, and they all wrote reports. And then there were summaries of the reports, and then there were summaries of summaries, and then uh, there were different 
agencies and all the peop all the crazy people that claimed that they had children with uh, Axel Wiener Grain or this or that, uh, they would send reports to the FBI and and it's huge than all the press reports. Uh, uh, yeah, not there's not a lack there's not a lack of documents. <laughs> Uh, on that subject, and without wanting to add burden, but uh, have you, apart from the, the possible archives of the Swedish uh, Secret Service, have you looked at the Rick's archive or the diplomatic archives, for instance? Yes, because I'm, uh, I looked at all the reports that my grandfather uh, sent uh, while well, he was uh, ambassador, and then uh, his, uh, his successor. And I mean, at Rick's archive, there is uh, there's now his his diary when his main lawyer died. Uh, he had Axel Wiener Green's diary, and uh, and uh, at the diplomatic archives in Arning, because uh, there, there's a wealth of uh, information. This is also why, in a way, it can be a an endless project uh, because there. You know the archives in uh, in Peru, in Mexico, in London, in uh, Berlin, in uh, Stockholm. Any other final comments, suggestions? I think this is a thing that we will certainly d develop even further. I think there are a number of intriguing threads, and uh, and if there are no further comments, I think. We'll very grateful to have Professor Lusek here to introduce this intriguing topic. And uh, thank you for coming. But in order to do I would say that I'm um, excused for this uh, parallel nannying that I've been indulging in. But I think that it's very intriguing also for me personally because today Latin American research, uh, one often gets the feeling that we are uh, indulging in something that is very parallel or even marginalized from the US. Intriguing to see a time when it was much more at the center of global intrigue and attention. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.